Hey guys, welcome to today's podcast, and we are so excited. We have Jason and Jennifer Hommel, and we are talking about Upper. I am such a fan of them, and I feel like what they're doing is actually radically changing people's lives. So welcome, guys. Thank you. Thanks for having us. So just so you know, what happened with me is I had a guy on one of our podcasts, Morley Robbins, on the show. And I was telling him that my iron was extremely low to the point where he, I, the doctor said, we're going to have to get you iron infusions. Your, your iron levels are astronomically low. Meanwhile, just so you know, I was eating grass fed beef and steak and like crazy. I was taking iron supplements. It didn't matter. Still, it'd be like your iron's low. And I'm like, how in the world is my iron still low? And he told me, I want you to start taking copper. And as soon as I started taking it, I literally, my iron levels improved instantly. So let's start with that because that's a personal experience of me. I want you to talk about how is that possible that just by me taking this copper, my iron levels immediately got normal? (laughs) Well, um, there have been some studies on mice that we published in our book that basically showed that, um, gosh, so they actually induced high high iron problems in mice because when you take too much iron, it actually blocks copper. And so then all sorts of high iron problems come in. So they, they gave these mice a ton of iron and then they said, let's see if we can reverse it with copper. And they started giving the mice about the human equivalent of about 25 milligrams of copper per day. And within three weeks, it reversed all the high iron problems. And one of the high iron problems, of course, is copper deficiency. So taking copper fixed the copper deficiency induced by the high iron. And we need copper to be able to um, make use of iron and turn it into red blood cells. So while iron is very often thought of as the number one nutritional solution for anemia and low red blood cell counts, it's actually copper. It gives us higher than normal red blood cell counts, kind of like um, athletes who do uh, blood doping, where they take the blood out and put the blood back in to get an artificially raised uh, red blood cell count. And you can get that just from copper, which sort of proves that uh, everybody is at least a little bit anemic because red blood cell counts going up is kind of is what those uh, high-level athletes want to be extra healthy for extra cardiovascular capacity. So, you know, with more copper... Um, Everybody heals. You're able to more, just the iron. iron that's in your body. That's right. I mean, it helps to convert the iron into making and making those red blood cells. Basically. So is part of the problem that I want you to talk about people taking maybe some of the supplement, like if they're even taking an iron supplement, but yet their iron count is not going up. What is the reason for that? And why do they have to add the copper in order for it to get into the cell? So I think there's a competitive inhibition and most iron supplements or in fact, most like one a day supplements have like 30 to 40 milligrams of iron and that much iron. Most people in their diets, they only get one milligram or less or 0.6 milligrams or less of copper. So it's very easy for the copper to block the iron when we're taking so much more iron. And it's then the, easy for the iron. Oh, sorry, iron, easy for the iron to block the copper when we're taking so much more iron. But, but it doesn't work the other way around until you get to like 2000 milligrams of copper. So when we're taking only 30 milligrams of copper, it's not blocking our iron. It helps the body use the iron. Like one of the things we're taking is one of the forms of copper is a copper sulfate. Iron sulfate becomes water soluble, which then makes it more easily bioavailable. Uh, as Morley even taught us, he says a lot of people have 10 times more iron locked away in the tissues than can even be detected on these blood tests. So the blood tests, first of all, are not accurate. When they test you, and say you're low in iron, you might be fully saturated with iron, but your body just can't use it. Then once you bring the copper in, all of a sudden your body can start uh, doing the metabolic processes required to make these conversions. Like one of the main things that copper gives us is a- more ATP for energy. And you, d- you need energy just for all the cellular processes in the body. So just from making more ATP alone, we're able to do these things that we need to do. So I had a friend of mine come over and we were getting ready to work out. It was early in the morning and I was telling her, I was like, you will not believe how much better I feel after taking this copper. And she's like, well, give me one. Well, we'd already worked out. It was on an empty stomach and I didn't realize it at the time. But I was like, here, take this copper. So I gave her a few copper and literally 
it yeah i gave her a few but it was like a three it was like a three milligram or something i think i gave her two and literally within about five minutes maybe even less she was like oh my gosh do you have any crackers i'm literally about to throw up she's like i feel so sick right now and i was like oh my gosh what's going on and i guess i didn't realize that when i was taking the copper i was doing it at mealtime and she was like it took her a while after she ate. She was fine. Like maybe like 30 minutes later, she was like, I feel fine. But she had to have something to eat. Why is it that taking the copper on an empty stomach can make you so nauseous? Well, I think probably our minerals are supposed to be in food. So that definitely helps. But there's quite a few reasons that we have found why copper makes us nauseous. One of the person, one, one somebody said that it could be waking up our vagus nerve. So copper stimulates and heals the nerves and in at least 20 to 200 different ways, just by detoxing a lot of things, making more ATP, acting as a neurotransmitter, helping us make neurotransmitters, all sorts of good things. And so if the vagus nerve, which is controlling the stomach, couldn't it get stimulated, it might make us want to vomit. So that's actually a good thing. But um, there's quite a few other things too. It could be fluoride detoxification. If fluoride gets goes into the stomach to bind with copper, because f- copper might be detoxing fluoride, it could also be... Uh, Extra high iron could also cause it. Um, extra vitamin A can cause it. Um, when people switch out and stop using their fluoride toothpaste, their nausea goes away. Uh, another thing that helps is uh, copper. High copper can induce a molybdenum deficiency, or if people are deficient in multiple nutrients, which is often the case, um, once people get their molybdenum up, they're less likely to have a little bit of na- nausea. So that that's another. Well, one thing that I've noticed too is that once you get used to taking that level of copper. You're no longer nauseous right. to that amount. So, like, if you're, you know, if you're at six milligrams and you take that for a while, then you'll the nausea will pretty much go away, and then you can titrate up. That's right, and go up a little bit. So, the studies they say that about half the people get nauseous from copper at about three to four milligrams. So, it's not unusual. Some people are concerned that, well, I don't have any nausea. Is that a problem? At least not a problem. It's just it's fifty fifty chance, right? So. Uh, we have about 12 different steps on how to alleviate nausea. And our belief is that you shouldn't push it so you're feeling nausea. If, you, if, you're, if you're having that trouble, take a little bit less, let time do the work, slowly adjust to the dose. That's how we titrate, titrate up or slowly scale up the amount of uh, doses that we're taking. We took about, oh gosh, um, a month to work up from 10 milligrams to 20 to 30 um, and you were on 10 milligrams for a good three years before you felt confident to push it beyond 15. You were on 9 to 15 for a good three years. And that was not enough to fix her low iron problems. She needed to get up to what those rats needed. It was about 20 to 30 milligrams. Do you want to talk about how much how much you improved with your anemia? Oh, my goodness. And bleeding yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, it was just, it was unbelievable. So, um, yeah, I had severe anemia. And we it even got to the point where even when we were on the copper, I was like, I don't know what to do. Maybe I need to go back and take iron supplements right. again. We know? didn't think so the copper was working. Took couldn't the figure it out. Older supplements and did that for another about six months, and then finally I was like, No, I don't think that this is the answer. And so we just continued. It was finally when I think you you hit um, uh, high iron problems that we're realizing. Well, clearly more iron can't be the answer, but we we're so scared to just take copper because we hadn't really done too much study in the beginning. You kind of have to figure it out by trial error. Out there yet. And uh but but we figured out that, you know, she could lose about a cup of blood without dying. Right, right. That's that was what the best. body makes about yeah. that much every day. I was day. like, how much blood can you lose in a day and, and still survive? And so we're like, okay, well if you have high iron problems, then then you don't need to take iron. Let's stop that. And sure enough that helped her body absorb the copper better. And you haven't really taken iron now in three years. That's right. huge. Right. And your anemia has stayed fixed without right. iron. That's like a mind bender. Yeah. That shouldn't supposed to happen, according to the modern radical who continually gives people iron infusions, which block copper and make everything worse. So it's, it's kind of amazing. Did you guys know that 97% of Americans are deficient in at least one mineral? It's true. You need more than a dozen minerals for your body to function in its best. But with the standard American diet, it's almost impossible. So here's where B Minerals comes in. Guess what? All you have to do, take one little shot of this one, one little shot of this one, and guess what? It looks like this, but it tastes like water. 
take one shot and boom, in 30 seconds a day, you're getting an entire thing of minerals instead of an entire cabinet of supplement bottles. So with Beam Minerals, we make mineral balance simple. So let's talk about if someone's listening to this and they go, okay, I want to try taking copper. I want you to talk about what they should do. I'm taking a liquid copper that I'm obsessed with. It's by Upgraded Formulas. I love it. It's my favorite kind to take. And so I just have been titrating up on that. Um, but as far as increasing the copper, I want you to talk about, okay, what would you suggest someone brand new? They've never taken copper. Where do they start? And then how do you know, okay, this is kind of where I need to end on that? And what symptoms would you say, if you have this, then you probably maybe need a little bit more copper? So what you're talking about is, you know, we've written a quick start guide that explains all this stuff. It's about a 20 minute read. I don't know if I have time to read that whole thing on the show. We've tried to read that on our show. We end up elaborating on every point and then it stretches for two hours. So um, I want to hit the highlights of what's important. And first of all, we suggest that people start with five milligrams, which is enough to help get past nausea and actually work. When people take only three milligrams, it's also not enough copper to really begin fixing any problems. And they get stuck in sort of a a detox haze and they get worse. So you need to get to five milligrams and higher. So we suggest people start with five milligrams for the, about two weeks, then they move up to 10 milligrams. And the way you do it, <laughs> because of nausea, you have to separate the dose. So it's two milligrams in the morning, two milligrams afternoon, two milligrams in the evening, at six, or you do one milligram in the evening. And um, by breaking up the dose, you can get a high enough dose to fix the problems yet avoid the nausea. And if you take it with food, that also helps. So the more copper you're taking throughout the day, it helps to um, uh, fix the problems. Um, gosh, so our quick start guide, again, it's a good 20 minute read. One of the main things is we have to stop eating margarine and trans fats, which are any hydrogenated fats, which are found of course in you know butter substitutes or uh, cookies and crackers. You have to read the ingredients. If it says hydrogenated, fat, hydrogenated fats or trans fats, don't eat it. And the reason is those are neurodegenerative. And so the body takes copper and helps to restore the myelin sheath around the nerves. The myelin sheath is a fatty sheath and it's this coating around the nerve that actually helps the nerves propagate and work a lot faster. If you'll notice when a kid learns to ride a bike, it's very wobbly and he can't adjust fast enough. So it takes about why it takes about two months for a kid to learn how to ride a bike. Why? Because it takes two months for the body to learn, I need faster reflexes. And the body begins to make these myelin sheath coatings around the nerves. And all of a sudden, it becomes super easy to ride the bike one day after struggling, 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 because the myelin sheaths have finally coated the nerves. So it creates fast reflexes, a fast mind, and all these neurodegenerative diseases, they're all characterized by the same thing demyelination of the nerves, whether it's autism or Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, they're all about demyelination of the nerves. So if you're taking a bad fat like margarine combined with copper, which takes fats and puts them into the nerves, you don't want to put nerve degeneration, nerve degenerating fats into the brain. It actually causes faster neurodegeneration, more brain fog. So you have to avoid the bad fats. Right. So the good fats then are butter, mm -hmm. coconut oil, olive oil, Avocado. avocados, things so like that. Oh, meat. Meat is fine. Just yeah. real, real food. Real milk, food. Milk, but a lot eggs, of times whenever you go out to eat, you know, they use all of these fats That's that you would normally be actively avoiding. We have know? to stop eating at IHOP. Sorry, IHOP. <laughs> you know, you ask these restaurant waitresses, is this real butter or is it margarine? They don't know the difference. They're like, it's, it's butter. It says margarine in the container. So, I mean... They don't know any better. Or the things we have to it's because it's like a mix of right. the hot dogs. They think butter is a, a catch-all term for all of it. It's not the same. Yeah. So it's, it's My a son loves the hibachi place. Oh, it's yes. like his favorite place to go. So what I do is I actually bring oil from home. I bring, um, sometimes we'll bring coconut oil or olive oil. And then we also bring in gluten-free soy sauce. And then we bring in our own butter because they use margarine as well. And so it's kind of like, okay, well, if you want to go there, we bring in all this stuff. And then they'll use that or use it. They will. That's awesome. Yeah, we started doing the same thing when we were forced to eat out at restaurants for a year. We would bring our stick of butter whenever we go out to eat to breakfast. Sure. Yeah. Bring your hot butter. It's amazing we did the same thing. That's great. Well, 
And I will say, if you're listening, you know, they've got some amazing books and I've read them all. Um, One's called The Copper Revolution Protocol, and they also have The Quick Start Guide. And then they also have one, Beyond the Arthritis Fix, a protocol for strong joints. So thank you. I have two issues that I still struggle with. One is I still have joint problems and I still have a little bit of skin issues. Um, They've gotten so much better, but I have a little bit of psoriasis on my scalp and in just a couple of spots that I haven't been able to get rid of. So one of the things that you guys talk about is I know that you guys are big fans. Your main focus on the healing power of copper um, because you think that's a mineral that is literally revolutionizing wellness. But there's also some other things, copper and then iodine, boron, MSM, sulfur, and some more. You have about 20 vitamins and minerals that you guys are really big fans of but then you, there's some other supplements that you're like, I'm not taking these. So I want you to talk specifically about what are your most important ones that you take and why some of the other big ones that you actually avoid. That's a, another big subject because it's a list of 20. So we're taking uh, copper and the next most important one to go with copper is zinc. They have to be in a right ratio. So um, dry skin in the hair can be from low zinc. You had an issue with that too. We were doing, um, you know, all the copper, all the zinc, and we're like, what's the, what's the problem? And when you cut out candy that contained uh, artificial food dyes, some of that scalp issues went away within like three days. Mm-hmm. And it was plaguing you for like 10 years. But I'd also been on the copper and all the minerals for two years at this point. So sometimes things just take a little bit of more time to, to heal, you know. It's kind of like you give your body all of these good inputs. And it just kind of goes about, you know, taking care of the little things first. And for me, my skin was like one of the very last things. But yeah, I had pretty yeah. severe. So retina. along with copper and zinc, the third most important one is probably vitamin C because all three are needed to make collagen. If you only give yourself two of the th- three big ingredients needed to make collagen, you're going to run, run out of the third one. So we have found that if you take a high dose copper and high dose zinc, you're going to run low on vitamin C, which can manifest in as a little bit of bleeding. It's just a normal amount, 1,000, 2,000 milligrams of vitamin C is what we take, and uh, it solves that problem. Um, probably the next one is uh, probably the B vitamins and maybe magnesium in combined because copper helps us make ATP for energy, but we also need the magnesium and the list of the uh, B vitamins as well. So that's five. Now, but probably- you, I know that you guys are big on avoiding right. B6 and B9. Is that correct? That's, that's right. right. So. We discovered when we tried to take um, five B complexes a day to really get a plenty of B vitamins, we were developing neuropathy in our hands. And about two months later, I figured out that, um, I guess it was the B6 that can cause the neuropathy once you get over 100 milligrams. And we were taking about 250 milligrams. So all of a sudden, when we stopped taking the B, the B complexes, it solved the neuropathy we were giving ourselves from the B complexes. So now we take them all individually and we avoid taking B6 to avoid that problem. Because foods contain plenty of B6. Yeah, you almost can't get deficient in B6 for an American unless you're starving. It's only in starving kids in Africa who ever have a B6 deficiency. And in fact, I think sometimes if people say, well, I've been diagnosed B6 deficiency, I'll say, good. Now you don't have that toxin in your body. You've got one less thing to worry about. It's very important for people to don't, not get scared by symptoms or or tests, but focus rather on symptoms because, uh, yeah, B6 is a neurotoxin. At over- so how do they do that? Because w- I guess part of the question is, is that, you know, a lot of these vitamins, they have, it's h- hard when you go get, because a lot of them are have like B complex and they have all these vitamins in it. Are you actually going and buying like B1, B2, B3 separate, all of them separate and taking them as separate? Separate. Separate. So we take a we do all of them, them separate. B one, two, three, B five, B seven, and B twelve. That's just the six B vitamins we take. So going down the list of all the vitamins we do take after the Bs, it's probably um, boron is next most important, and, and boron is great for the joints, it kills mold, a bunch of other good things. Next most important is probably selenium and iodine, which are very important for boosting health and boosting uh, hormones and detoxifying the body. I think. 
I'd like to put iodine second, but you can't take copper without the zinc. And then, and iodine is so hard for a lot of people to take because it results in allergies because it's so detoxing. So once you get the allergies under control with copper, zinc, and vitamin C and other things, you need your energy up with B vitamins, then it's easier to graduate onto these harder minerals to start like iodine uh, and selenium. Iodine is important, not just for the thyroid, but every single cell in the body needs it. And man, that fixed so many things. And it gave me stronger emotional regulation. It also boosts intelligence. The iodine doctors discovered that pregnant women who start taking iodine at only 12 milligrams often end up with babies that are 30 to 40 IQ points higher than the parents. The army did studies between World War I and World War II, and they found that the intelligence went up across America in these uh, goiter belt areas like in Michigan. IQ went up by 15 points just by putting the iodine in the salt, which is only 0.1 milligrams. It's tremendous. Iodine is so good for our brains. Just like copper, it also helps to restore the myelin sheath. So um, very, very important for Yes. Yeah, so I don't take iodized salt. I only, you know, use sea salt or pink Himalayan or I use Celtic sea salt. And so I will tell you, I feel like a new woman when I take iodine or any foods that have iodine in it. It's it's, it's terrific. literally unbelievable how I feel mm. when I either take the iodine supplement or I just take foods that are really high in, in iodine. My husband, there's this, um, he will take these demoshi bowls and then he gets like seaweed salad and all this other stuff in it. And he always says, he's like, it's unbelievable. When I take, when I eat sushi or I would, you know, take seaweed and I take it in high doses and then also take iodine, he's like, I have still like a, di a new person. Yeah. yeah, seafood cravings uh, and sushi cravings could very well be iodine deficiency speaking to people. Yeah. So let's talk about um, B12 because right now B12 is a really controversial topic. And, you know, I've looked into B12 and there's actually four types of B12, but there's two that I want to talk about in general. But cyanocobalamin is an artificial form of B12. And they say that because, like, if you think cyan, right, has cyanide and it's a poison and that you shouldn't take that. And other people say that you should take methylcobalamin instead. That's, really That's the one. So talk about that for just a little bit. Well, you said you, there were four forms. So I'm, I know about three of them. So keep going. <laughs> I don't know. Um, there's another one that's called a hydroxocalum. Hydrox hydroxocobalamin, and then there's also adenos cobalamin as well. Mm -hmm. well familiar with the adenos uh, cobalamin, right? So, mm -hmm. I just think the methylcobalamin form is safer. Um, I don't know if there's necessarily been any problems out there from people taking the cyanocobalamin form, but um, there are some voices out there that say that there's a, a B12, which is in our they call it uh, amygdala, not B12, sorry, a, a B17. And it, it has some cyanide in it, which can kill cancer. So it's not necessarily always all bad, but if it is a toxin, <laughs> right? I mean, but if it's in, I haven't done a ton of research to know that necessarily the people have problems, but from the cyano form, but uh, methyl seems safer. So we just settled on the methyl form and um, we're happy with that. We take like a whopping uh, 5,000 micrograms, the, which is the larger dose in a chewable form daily and uh i have noticed that if i don't take it sometimes i'll get a little bit of neuropathy here and there but if i take it regularly uh no problems i don't know about you guys but i am stressed and if you're feeling overwhelmed this holiday season then i get it with all the family get-togethers it is just a relentless source of stress but anyway there is something that i've got called stress guardian and it's actually made by Bioptimizers, the people who make the magnesium breakthrough, which I love, love, love. But anyway, they are literally made this new product. It has 14 adaptogenic herbs and it just regulates your stress. I just actually took some right this second. And it's awesome. If you go to stressguardian.com slash waste away and put in waste away for 10% off your first order. So it's stressguardian.com slash waste away. Go there now. Yeah. So as you know, we've had Morley Robbins on our show, I think three or four times. 
And you and him have both developed your protocols entirely independently. And I know that you guys agree on so many things um, that you agree on, and you're both huge fans of copper. But there's a few things that you guys are on different pages on. So I want you to talk about a few things that you guys are differ and what those are. So I was uh, talking to Morley quite a bit as I was finishing up writing my book, and he came and published his book just before I did. And fortunately, I was able to have quite a few of these conversations. He was very generous to this time, and that's very helpful. Um, and he also gave us quite a few suggestions. He's like, if you really want to improve your copper, why are you taking zinc? Because zinc can block copper. So, you know, that makes a little sense. So we decided to try taking less zinc. And it went okay for about a couple of months. I went all the way down to 10 milligrams of zinc. And then I noticed a bunch of low zinc symptoms began hitting like low libido, dry skin. Um, I think it was maybe more allergies set in. Um, insomnia hit. And zinc is good for all of those things. And so um, what was interesting is that I couldn't just bring the zinc back up to 50 milligrams, what I had been taking. I had to bump it up to 75 to 125 milligrams of zinc for a few weeks to get the zinc back up. And then I could finally drop it back to our normal level, about 50. Because once you're zinc deficient, <laughs> you know, you have to work to get it back up to normal levels. So we tried it his way on that one and uh, it didn't work for us. Um, you know, but he's a, but also he's not taking the high dose copper we are. So that's another difference. You know, we're taking 30 milligrams of copper plus 70 milligrams of copper topically, and we need the higher zinc to be in balance. Now I know why he says no zinc. And the, the reason why he says no zinc is because it can deplete copper and there's a way that it does it. Zinc helps to make metallothionines, which is a family of enzymes, which uh, have a greater affinity for, for copper than zinc, but they really contain both copper and zinc. And they can co carry copper out of the body. That's the theory. But they do a lot more than just that. These metallothionines also, they detox mercury, cadmium, arsenic, and lead. And, you know, the average person has as much lead as copper in their body, which is about 70 milligrams of each. That's really bad. We need to detox the lead. And the only way to do that is with zinc. In fact, zinc has an affinity with lead. They're often found together in ores in the earth. And that's how, you know, so that they detox each other. So... I don't see met metallothionines as strictly and only bad like Morley does. They also detox these other things. Uh, um, I, want to, I want you to talk about putting copper on your body um, and doing it on your skin as well. Um, so I found this upgraded formula as liquid copper, and I've been putting the liquid copper on my skin as well. Um I want you to talk about that. Like what kind are you putting on your skin and how to balance putting it on your skin and then ingesting it? Okay. So uh, we um, discovered the copper sulfate and we discovered we could make that ourselves in a two ounce bottle for about uh, three cents. It's about uh, five eighths of a teaspoon of uh, crystals at the bottom and the rest filled with uh, boiled water. We distilled shake it up, water. boiled distilled water and we shake it up and then all of a sudden... It makes about a one milligram per drop solution. So that's what we use to add drops to our coffee in the morning al along with a bunch of other minerals. And then when we apply that to our skin, I just pour about, oh, seven drops or seven milligrams in the palm of my hand, rub it like this. And if I rub it too vigorously, it will, it will splash. But then I apply it, you know, to my shoulders and upper arms. Okay. And I do that about 10 times around the body. So then it's like upper back and chest, and then it's, you know, belly and sides and hips and legs and all the rest. Um, and it's just a great way to absorb minerals through the skin. It um, seems to also, when we put it on our underarms, it also seems to kill germs. So we don't it's a have a great deodorant. Yeah. And not only is it a deodorizer, but it also stops excessive sweating, which has been my lifelong problem. So that's nice. And it's, you know, it's good for the skin. Because... Maybe a quarter size, would you say? Or maybe like yeah, half like dollar size? Like filling in, filling in the palm of your hand. And you, if you put too much, when you try to go like this and it's splashing, you've done too much. So I just, it's about, yeah, six to seven drops will be just enough to avoid splashing too much. Okay. And then you just put it all over your what? arms and kind of around your shoulders and stuff like that. And then for that, is do you not have to titrate up as much? And can you do that? Because obviously a lot of people who are listening to this show, as long as well as me, I do intermittent fasting. So it's 1130 right now and I haven't eaten anything. And like you said, you know, you want to kind of take it in doses. So 
if someone's doing fasting, could they do the liquid version of that, you know, before they ate? Because that way they wouldn't get nauseous. They can, but they, you, you, the first five times we did topical copper for you, you got nauseous, but it was less and less each time. And I, I just said, drink more water and it fixed it for her. Uh, the very first time I did it, I had like a little bit of nausea and then I've never had nausea from it ever since. So it kind of depends on maybe your toxicity level or overall general. And another thing too, whenever you use it topically, it can dry out your skin in the beginning. Right. But then your skin, I don't, it just adapts to right. it and it gets used to it. So then it's not dry anymore. Or if, yeah. if you just take a little bit more zinc or maybe have a little bit more butter in the diet, yeah. that fixes dry skin problems. We found a lot of people, they complain about the dry skin that happens if they're beginning topical copper or copper in general. You've got to keep these minerals in balance. You know, because copper sulfate that we use, it is a salt. That's right. And so, you know, you are applying a salt to your skin so it can dry it out a little bit, but over time it will yeah. normalize. Some of the other things we notice, it will stay in uh, clothing. So we're, we're wearing... We're fixing that problem by just wearing our, our blue shirts, you know, the color of copper sulfate. <laughs> and then um, it stains some of your clothing, your mm -hmm. work clothing too. But, um, you know, we just, you, if, the, if the clothing gets stained, we just put some vinegar in the wash. That's not always necessarily required though, but um, yeah, that, that helps. Guys, I just want to interrupt for just a second. And I want you to hear Paul Saladino talk about why liver is so important. And if you don't like liver, we have another option for you. Your ancestors were eating liver. And the reason that this sort of wisdom has been passed down is because liver is very nutritious. It's basically nature's multivitamin. If you look at the nutrients in meat, they're great. You've got zinc, you got B6, you got B12, you got some K2. But if you look at liver, it really complements what's in muscle meat. And there are many unique nutrients found in organs, specifically liver as a powerhouse of these, that are difficult to obtain outside of liver. Like meat and organs are like peanut butter and jelly. They just go together. They're supposed to be eaten together. The easiest way to eat liver is just to do it raw. If you don't want to eat liver raw, you can cook it. But the reason that I like to do it raw is because there are unique nutrients in liver that are probably somewhat degraded when you cook the liver. This really is like the most nutrient rich supplements that you can find. And they are amazing. I have tried them. I absolutely love them. So just go to heartandsoil.co, use the coupon code Chantal Ray and save you some money there. That's great. So let's talk about potassium for a second, because I believe, you know, I'm always feeling like I'm potassium uh, deficient. And it's funny because like when I have coconut water or avocado or anything that has high potassium and a lot of people who are maybe doing like a keto diet or they're doing, you know, they're avoiding potatoes or sweet potatoes and things that really have high potassium. Um, and they're feeling terrible. So how important is potassium and how do you know if you're potassium deficient? Mm -hmm. It's a, a great topic. Um, gosh, when we first got together, you were supplementing with both sodium salt as well as potassium. An eighth of a teaspoon of each is kind of what we settled on. And um, I, I was like, I don't know if this is right, but... Uh, I, I'd heard, you know, the iodine doctors, they recommend uh, salt as a supplement, salt your way to health was uh, one of his videos and books. And so I just jumped on the bandwagon because I believe those doctors must have known what they were talking about. I figured I'd maybe research later if it became a concern. Eventually it did become a concern. I lost my cardiovascular capacity and you would take me for walks. And, I'll, and I thought it was maybe because I was bodybuilding too much or whatever, but I, it was after I had a, a box of salty crackers one time. And, and there were good crackers of Whole Foods, but we went on this walk and within 30 minutes I was hyperventilating and I had to sit down and I couldn't believe it. And it was from excess of salt. That's what salt does. It does that and it, it causes a host of about 50 health problems that are all related to dehydration. And what we have in every cell is a sodium potassium pump and it's always pumping the sodium out and the potassium in. In other words, the potassium is the nutrient the cells want and the sodium is always pumped outside the cell because they don't want it. Um, and in fact, the concentrations are, are mind boggling. There's like 30 times more sodium outside the cell than inside the cell. And there's about 15 times more potassium inside the cell than outside the cell. And this is important because water follows where the minerals are. So if you're more mineralized outside the cells, you're going to be dehydrated. So the more salt you take in, salt is a dehydrating mineral because it's pulling the water outside the cells to go where the 
sodium is, which is outside the cell. But when you take in a lot of potassium, where does the water want to go? Water goes to, wants to go inside the cells and so the cells get hydrated. So that, that's the number one thing you have to remember. If you want to be hydrated, you've got to take potassium. Potassium helps kick out sodium and sodium helps kick out potassium. So they're antagonists. So what is standard in the American diet? We're all high sodium. We all need to be high potassium and low sodium. But you can't always make these transitions quickly because if you do, what's the first thing that's going to happen if you take potassium when you haven't taken it in a long time? The body's going to finally be able to kick out a ton of sodium and then you become sodium toxic and you have the symptoms of sodium toxicity from taking potassium because the body's finally making a change and then you get things like people suffer things like racing heart and all sorts of high sodium problems and they go, oh, potassium's not just not for me. Give it a few days, take a little bit of time, know what you're doing, and trust the process. Mm -hmm. You, do, I mean, human beings are not so different that somebody's pumping sodium and potassium the wrong way. We all have the same sodium and potassium pump. We all will benefit from potassium. We will all benefit from lower sodium. Just trust the process. Take a little bit of time. Make gradual changes, and 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 you'll love it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's talk about selenium because selenium is really important for making thyroid hormones, detoxing mercury, and being an anti-cancer agent. And I know once I started taking selenium, I had I basically take a very low dose of a the only medicine I take is a very low dose of natural desiccated thyroid, and I'm weaning myself off of even that to have nothing. Um, but I'm not quite there yet. It's a, the lowest dose that you can get and um, and I'm move off of that. But the selenium has made a huge difference. And I think the copper too, um, of why my, my thyroid is now functioning again. So talk about why selenium is so important and does the copper also affect the thyroid at all? Well, you just, you covered everything that I was going to say. <laughs> we, need, we need copper, selenium, and iodine to make the thyroid. Iodine, yeah, that's a huge All one. Yeah, three of those hormones. The, you know, the um, the the T four hormone has four atoms of iodine. The T three has three atoms of iodine. So iodine is the big one, but copper and selenium are the top two cofactors. Selenium was indicated by the iodine doctors as a cofactor for iodine because sometimes when people only would take iodine, they would have a oxidative stress induced response in the thyroid gland. And selenium acts as an antioxidant, which prevents thyroid damage in cases of Hashimoto's. So people with Hashimoto's form of uh, thyroid problems would benefit from taking selenium for about a month beforehand. We also believe that copper is very helpful because copper helps us to make a large amount of antioxidant enzymes, including superoxide dismutase, the metallothionines we talked about, and a bunch of different antihistamine uh, enzymes that all help the body uh, deal with oxidative stress. So this is another area where the research is mixed, where the enemies of copper will say, oh, oh copper's an oxidant. Well, all these minerals that will accept and release uh, oxygen, they act as both antioxidants and oxidants at the same time because oxygen comes, oxygen goes. And in fact, if it didn't work like that, it wouldn't be able to work in the mitochondria to accept an oxygen and release an oxygen in the process of making ATP for energy. So it has to go back and forth in order to be beneficial. Um, so I want, so I want you to also talk about some things that you try to avoid. So, well, first, first, okay. Well, first, I want you to say I want to hear kind of a day in the life of Jason and Jennifer. So, sure. like, like from the beginning, and then after that, I want to hear kind of some of the things that you want to avoid and try to be as detailed as possible. Okay. Jennifer, you want to start? Sure. 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 Um, we get up every morning about 5 a.m. And we start, Jason makes us coffee in our French press. You know, we don't like to use plastic. So we use a glass French press to make our coffee. We use a glass water pedal. Um, glass mugs, non ceramic. Glass, everything's glass. So we, we put a lot of our minerals into our coffee. Right. And so we have A2 milk and organic sugar in our coffee, along with a lot of our minerals. If I go through the Yeah, let's go through all the minerals. When I make your coffee in the morning, I, I first start, I put the powders in the cup first, right? I start with two teaspoons, two teaspoons of sugar. Then I add the cinnamon. Then I add the MSM, a teaspoon of MSM sulfur. 
Then I add a quarter teaspoon of uh, new salt and a quarter teaspoon of boron. So that's all my dry ingredients. Then I pour the coffee. And then I add the wet ingredients on top. And I add the, uh, first I add um, potassium iodide, which is yellow. And it's a full strength. And I add six drops of that for a whopping 300 milligrams. Then I add the six drops of 5% Lugol's iodine because we should be having both. Now Lugol's has both potassium iodide and iodine in it, but I still have one of each. After that, then I add four drops of selenium to get about 200 micrograms of selenium. And then I add the copper for the final uh, 15 drops of copper in each cup. Then I add the milk and it is done. Mm -hmm. We I, use A2 milk. I kind of stir in the minerals as I'm bringing them because they can mix and I don't want to put iodine directly in with mm -hmm. the copper, but if you mix them, it probably doesn't bother. And then we use okay. whole milk, A2 milk, Usually from bronze. Right. Um, and so we, that, and that's how we start our day. Like every single every day, day. Start, every oh. day we have our coffee with our minerals. So they say coffee. And I'm glad you said that because here's the thing. If you take those drops just regular, like in your mouth, they're disgusting. Yeah, they're You're like, oh my God, this is the worst thing. Oh, ever. if you put iodine. But like we that. have to come up with a better way to yeah, do it. Yeah, if you put iodine right on your tongue, you will literally burn your tongue off and you'll be hurting it for a long time. No, if you put it. proper sulfate on your tongue, it's then you disgusting. can't get the taste out of your mouth for about 30 minutes. It's awful. It's awful. But well, the coffee is a great idea because it coffee's coffee. got such a strong taste. So when you put that in your coffee, do you not even really taste it? With no. The sugar and the cinnamon and the milk, you can't taste it at all. I mean, coffee is naturally bitter, and coffee is also naturally demineralizing. So adding all the minerals to the coffee seems to create a bit of a balance for that, too. But mm -hmm. you know how, like, you can go out for Starbucks or coffee? That's not attractive to us anymore because it doesn't have any of our minerals. It doesn't have any of the good things that we now crave. So I only crave the coffee that we make at home, which, you know, costs us, ooh, 50 cents. It's great. Yeah, it doesn't have to and so, and so then from there, um, right. And so, you know, I, 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 I used to practice intermittent fasting all of the time and I'm actually just getting back to it, but I'm going to do the every other day diet, um, a la Krista Verity, um, you know, the modified to where it's like 500 calories one day and then normal the next day. So within that framework our coffee with milk and sugar kind of fits into that so i i don't feel like i'm you know cheating on that i to grab those little containers of b vitamins no. right over there and show them sure just the uh -huh. the handful of vitamins that we take uh about every other day yeah so we just have our little days um i love that and out and we just put all of our b vitamins and our magnesium and that's like, yeah, all of our B vitamins, the magnesium, the uh, manganese, yeah, the vitamin C, yeah, or, there's about probably 10 or 12 pills in there. And, yeah. And then at night we take a zinc and that's it. Right. But so, so another thing we have. And why, hold on. Why do you take the zinc at night? What's the reason for that? Zinc is calming and it helps sleep. And so, um, helps us sleep. It helps us sleep more deeply. We re recently added the manganese. Oh my gosh. The sleep has been through the roof good. I thought they turned. It was long. great before. And we didn't realize it could get any better. I know. It's even deeper the and more. I don't have to like roll over as much. Super vivid dreams, super long, super detailed. It's really incredible. Right. Yeah. So so then after our coffee, then we typically will do soft boiled eggs and we use our oh. instant pot for that. In the morning. Yeah. In the morning. That's our new morning, morning ritual. Mm -hmm. I made the coffee, you make the eggs. That's right. And <laughs> I love a soft boiled egg. It's like my favorite. Once yes. you start making it soft boiled, you never will eat a hard boiled oh, egg. Right. They're perfect. I'm eating about this. five eggs and you eat two and then you right. take two to work. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, yeah, and then we take our dog for a walk and then I'm off to work and Jason works from home. And then, and then in the evening, we typically have some kind of beef meal. Like we do burgers. Um, we don't specifically avoid gluten or wheat or any of those things that so we have a hamburger with a, you know, ciabatta bun. A popular snack we're eating a lot of these days is uh, apples and cheese. Right. Uh, I'll often, often have uh, toast uh, with butter and jam during the day or maybe a bagel. Right. What are some of the snacks those that are you're having? Buns. Those are my favorite. What snacks are you having at work? Um, the, your, I typically will do apples and cheese or... Cottage cheese. Cottage cheese or yogurts mm -hmm. or something. I, I was doing um, a lot of uh, granola and yogurts for a while until one day I just had a bit of nausea and I haven't had it in six months. So 
But we we really don't have a, a lot of food rules other than That's right. no margarine, no bad fats. Um, we were eating excessive tomatoes and probably sweet potatoes for a while. And then we, we learned about the dangers of excess vitamin A. We cut out the sweet potatoes. It's a little bit little, But we still have it occasionally. We were getting a, uh, occasional little red bump zit-like rashes that completely went away within three days of dropping back our vitamin A intake. So that was interesting. Well, I want you to talk about joint pain because you have a book, your first book called Beyond the Arthritis Fix protocols for strong joints. And for me, that is my number one issue that I feel like I I eat super clean. I do everything that I possibly can to be healthy, but I feel like my joints are really a problem. So give people a tasting of that book. If, if you were going to say to me, all right, here's a couple things I would do immediately to fix your joints, what would that be? I would say that the top two things that really got me through about 90% of my joint pain was introducing green smoothies into my diet and then doing a lot of isometric stretching, whereby you take a, your, so you, so to stretch here and to eliminate joint pain from the tip of your elbow all the way down to here, you, you bend it, right? And then you flex it. So you're both stretching it and flexing it at the same time for about six seconds and then you do the other one. Oh. And then that, when you're in joint pain, it hurts tremendously. But going through and pushing through the pain like that eliminates the pain in your body. And I read quite a bit of some gymnasts who said that what they were told, eat a salad before gymnastics practice, you'll, your joints will never be better. Uh, and so sure enough, it just it just works. People talk about the oxalate problem, demineralizing problem of greens, so that is a problem. However... They also remove a lot of toxins and toxins lodge in the joints, especially in the bones and in the tendons because the blood supply is not so good. So it's very hard to detox those areas. So taking demineralizers actually works to help kick out the toxic minerals from the joints. And sometimes when people on our protocol, they take our protocol and they're like, I'm getting acne or I'm losing my hair. What's going on? I say almost always. I'm like, well, are you doing the greens and the green smoothies? No. Well, if you do green smoothies, it allows the toxins to bind to something in the gut on the way out. You need to have that those greens and that fiber, so they're very detoxing. But again, the problem of excessive greens is they're very demineralizing. So when I did about three years worth of green smoothies, I got all the symptoms of demineralization. I had uh, constipation. I had uh, cramped muscles. Uh, I was weak in the gym. Um and when I just added one multi-mineral pill, it was just my start into learning about the minerals. Uh, the next week, uh, and within three days, the cramping back problems I had went away. The constipation went away. Um, and I was stronger in the gym on all my lifts simultaneously. I'm like, wow, the minerals really are important. And greens, they are demineralized. So what, what minerals would you say for constipation? Because it's funny because one time, I, that's another problem I have is constipation. And it's funny because I've said it so many times on the podcast, people email in all the time and they're like, oh, I, you know, whatever problem you have, they relate to, right? So they're like, I have constipation too. What do you think I should do? So what would you say to someone who you would say that the constipation is a major problem? What do they need to do to fix that? There are there are a good five ways to fix constipation. And uh, the first is uh, magnesium citrate is the most common and probably one of the most effective. Um, but potassium also works too. But when you first start potassium, if you start it too fast and too furiously, it causes the opposite problem and can cause constipation. And that's what happened to me because I, I'm a man, I can adjust and I'm healthy, but I had constipation really bad. Remember that was horrible. And uh, when I first started, so potassium works, but slowly make a slow adaptation because it's hydrating. Um, but again, if it's kicking, kicking out a ton of salt, then it's it's weird and bad. Um, you can take copper to the point you will have loose stools. And I did that. I took copper up to 50 milligrams a day. Um, and uh, if you're having loose stools every single day, you're, you might be pooping out more minerals than you're able to hold in. So it becomes counterproductive once you have nothing but loose stools for a week. So 50 milligrams was too much and I went back down. But when I've tried to take more copper, again, I don't have that problem nowadays. So it's it's like I'm getting healthier. So 
uh, magnesium, potassium, copper. You can also take vitamin C to bowel tolerance. So that can fix it too. Part of the reason why copper works, let me backtrack here, and magnesium work is that they're also needed for peristalsis, which is um, contracting of the intestines in the muscles. If the muscles can't make their ATP and they're not strong enough, they won't contract and so things won't move along. But that could be a problem, basic mineral deficiencies. And that gets fixed, of course, also with B vitamins. Because we need magnesium, B vitamins, and copper to make the ATP for energy for muscle contractions. I mm, love it. All right. So let's end with a few things that you don't want to take. That you say a lot of people, this is the hype. They're like, take it, take it, take it. And you found that you actually feel better when you don't take it. I try to get to at least five of our, our list of 30 things we're not taking. But the number one is uh, iron. You haven't taken iron in three years and you have no anemia whatsoever because, uh, it's never a problem of not being able to absorb iron, and iron is already supplemented into the foods. I mean, we have high iron uh, irons in the meat. They're putting iron in all breads, and even greens are high iron. So how could you eat a low iron diet? Once you're able to absorb the iron with the copper and vitamin C, as well as make use of it, it's not a problem. So we really don't need to take any excess iron. It only causes problems of, of copper deficiency. So no iron. Um, no vitamin A, no vitamin D. For 50 years now, the, each of these has been widely touted as potentially toxic because they're fat soluble vitamins and so they're getting trapped in the fat one thing we know about toxins and fat is the fat traps toxins and one thing we know about toxins is that they stay in the body so all of the nutrients on our list are things that are quickly and rapidly rapidly and easily excreted which is why they carry out other toxins toxins build up like fluoride has a 22 year half-life mercury builds up in the body it's awful so Vitamins A and D, which get trapped in the fat and build up, we avoid those because they, they can be toxic. And in fact, on our protocol- Well, let's, let's talk a little bit more about vitamin D because I know that that is a very controversial topic because doctors will say something like 90% of the population is vitamin D deficient. And obviously, the best form of vitamin D would be if someone went out in the sun they just went and got naked <laughs> or had as much of their body exposed to the sun, getting the vitamin D from their eyes. Um, but you talk about why is it that everyone is so vitamin D deficient? Is it because they're not going in the sun or is it a different reason? I think it's because most, most Americans are, are significantly copper deficient. I'll talk about that briefly. And it's that most people can only get 0 0.6 milligrams of copper per day or less in their diets. The government, when it was establishing their RDAs, they tried giving women 0.58, which is so close to that 0.6, 0.58 of a milligram of copper, and uh, they gave it to 10 women, and eight of them developed copper deficiency symptoms so quickly and so severe that they had to terminate the experiment, and, they, and then they said it was unethical to try to replicate that experiment, and yet 80% of Americans are getting that or less since the 70s, so they haven't corrected this major problem, and it's it's almost a, a scandal uh, that they haven't fixed it. So with copper, we're able to make vitamin D because again, we need to we need uh, energy to be able to make hormones. Vitamin D is actually a hormone, um, and uh, we make hormones largely from cholesterol in the body. So cholesterol is not even really that bad. Another myth that they try to teach us all about. People on our protocol who couldn't get their vitamin D up. Um, beyond, let's say, 25, while taking vitamin D supplements. They go on our protocol, stop taking vitamin D, and then they get their vitamin D levels up to 50. So vitamin D tests are not even that effective because they can't measure what's in the fat. They only measure what's in the blood. So that's wrong. <laughs> um, and the other thing is there's probably 15 to 20 different forms of hormone D. It shouldn't even be called a vitamin, so that's wrong. Um, not that vitamin D is bad, but when you supplement vitamin D and you're only taking one form of hormone, the body responds by shutting down the hormone production. So that's bad. And yeah, see, that, that is the problem. I think that I don't think people talk about that enough is that if you take too much of this and then you don't take enough of that, how your body can be, you know, in balance. Right. So the, the, the one, the things we're not taking are the things that when you take it, they don't solve the problem that they say they're supposed to solve. We're supposed to take vitamin D in theory to have strong bones. It doesn't work that way. The studies have shown that vitamin D, while it helps us absorb calcium in the body, the calcium goes to the wrong places. And the calcium actually leaches out of the bones and causes things like kidney stones and gallstones and joint problems. So vitamin D just creates havoc in the body 
the kind of havoc that makes the medical establishment rich. So that's probably why the medical establishment and media promote vitamin D because it really does nothing in the body um, that's helpful. Um, at small amounts, when we make it, sure, it's that's fine and we stay in balance. Um, and so that's what we aim for. I love it. Now, well, just like, it, yeah. So it's like, you know, if you take iron, it wrecks iron metabolism and makes things worse because it puts copper out of balance. When you take vitamin D, and calcium, it lowers magnesium, which, and without magnesium, calcium precipitates out of, in the body into the soft tissues. And so when vitamin D is used as rat poison, it has the same mechanism of action as excessive vitamin D in the body. It calcifies the soft tissues. So, yeah. Did you guys know that your thyroid's main food is iodine? And guess what? Mercury and other toxins gobble up your selenium. And your thyroid glands need selenium to convert iodine to thyroxine. So if you have mercury fillings and with all the toxins and mold, your selenium gets, just gets gobbled up. So here's the bottom line. I take something called peak thyroid. It's got iodine, it's got copper, and it's got selenium. Everything you need to get your thyroid back to functioning without medicine. So go to ChantelRayWay.com slash upgraded formulas. Use the coupon code ChantelRay to get a huge discount. I love it. Well, I will tell you one thing. I don't care what the studies say, but I know for a fact adding copper has been probably one of the most impacting things that I've done. The copper, the iodine, like you said, the the copper, iodine, and selenium, if I had to pick three, would probably for me be the most impactful thing that's that I've done. I appreciate all the work you guys are doing. You're changing lots of lives. Tell listeners where they can find you and where they can follow you. So if you guys type in the Copper Revolution on Facebook, there's our Facebook group that has 41,000 members over the last two years. We've grown really fast, mostly by word of mouth. That's amazing. Well, our books are being sold on Amazon. The Copper Revolution, Healing with Minerals is on Amazon. It's a blue blue book like the t-shirt. And then also at my website, revealingfraud.com. It's where I have most of all our free essays and our free guides that are kept up to date that explain why we can't take margarine when we're taking copper, all the co-nutrients and all the vitamins and minerals that we're taking. I love it. Well, you guys are changing lots of people's lives. I appreciate all the work you're doing and hopefully you'll come back for another episode. And you guys to come back. Thank you so much. Thank you so great. much. And you guys stay tuned. We've got another episode coming up in just a few. Bye-bye for now. <laughs>